what I want to talk to you about today. I, I work for the New Zealand Treasury. The New Zealand Treasury is the um, government's uh, chief economic and financial advisor. It also has a role as a central agency, as the jargon goes, which is about uh, catalyzing, uh, bringing different departments together to think differently about uh, overall uh, economic, social, and environmental matters. So the way we, uh, what I've been tr trying to do over the last uh, four or five years that I've been in government, before that I was in the private sector, is to push along this concept that uh, if you're genuine about uh, well-being, then you have to think about economic, environmental, and social issues in an integrated way. The purpose of public policy is to improve people's lives. We have no right to define what is a good life or a bad life. So the puzzle is, what is the role of public policy in trying to improve people's lives without passing a judgment on what those lives be? And we go to Amartya Sen. Uh, if you are going to read one more book before you die, you have to read this book, The Idea of Justice. Have a handkerchief next to you because you'll cry for 375 pages. <laughs> but um, he talks about, um, in that context, he talks about giving people the opportunities and capabilities to live the kinds of lives they have reason to value. So that's the platform, philosophical platform for um, policy. It was very difficult to get this concept across because I'm surrounded by very capable, very analytical people who have studied very traditional economics. And uh, the first challenge was to demonstrate that this wasn't waffle. Uh, for those foreigners uh, uh, who don't understand the term waffle, it's just rubbish, garbage, or whatever you use. And so the challenge was to show that, in fact, using their very economic models, I can demonstrate with their own techniques that, in fact, unless you take into account environmental and social matters, the whole thing collapses anyway. Um, and so I spent three years and still doing it. I, day and night, I work on building mathematical models to demonstrate that because that's the language these people understand to show that, in fact, unless you bring in economics, social, and environmental issues in an integrated way, then the whole thing is not sustainable. So the essence of the model in diagrams is that uh, what we say is the purpose of ultimate purpose of policy is to improve intergenerational well-being. In other words, it's not only about today's, but also about future generations. And then we argue that uh, the source of well-being is not just material consumption, but, but consumption of um, spiritual things, leisure, environment, um, arts, whatever else you want to add to it. So um, a Nobel Prize economist called Kenneth Arrow thankfully defined that as comprehensive consumption in the broadest sense of what we enjoy. And then uh, the model says, that the source of comprehensive well-being is comprehensive wealth. In other words, it's not only capital in the machinery sense of human-built capital, but also natural resources, social capital, human capital, environmental capital, and economic capital. And then you uh, build a model which says uh, the drivers of that is the growth and protection of those capital stocks being very aware that they are very interdependent on each other. And then you ask the fundamental question, that's all fine, it looks elegant, it looks attractive, but what could be the role of public policy in that domain? Why, what could government do towards improving the capabilities and opportunities of people to live the kinds of lives they have reason to value? Those are the ones that surround what I call the well-being frontier. In other words, public policy, by building the right economic, social, and environmental infrastructures, uh, because nobody else will do it, because you don't do it as a private person because you don't get to all the benefits. Hence the word externalities, only a public 
organization would do that. You try to build the infrastructure that gives you a platform for higher material well-being, which every study shows is important in people's lives, but also care about equity, especially equity not only across society but across generations. In principle, although in the democratic process typically governments tend to have a short-term perspective, in principle they should be the only ones who talk about generations many uh, centuries forward. Sustainability is not only about economic but also sustainability of all those capital stocks and you can add more to those capital stocks if you wish. And finally, in an increasingly diverse world, for a country that aspires to be open, uh, welcoming, small but open, a social cohesion. How do you not only get more people to come into this world of New Zealand, but also get them to live together in a way that actually generates more creativity and all that kind of stuff, the stuff that is going on right here, right now. So, finally, resilience. In other words, uh, what are the big, big systemic risks that New Zealand may be exposed to, and what can we do to invest towards enhancing that resilience? It could be biosecurity issues, it could be economic, it could be social, um, earthquakes and whatever else you want to be. So we frame policy in that way, saying that the domain of uh, public policy is to make sure that we push that well-being frontier out by working across those particular dimensions. What does that mean for policy purposes? Uh, that's simply a policy triangle and it says at the very bottom, uh, although there is very robust evidence, and you will fall off your chairs, but we had a uh, presentation from a very senior person from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in our building only yesterday, saying there is no doubt anymore, whichever culture, wherever you talk to, the fundamentals, domains of well-being, in other words, what people actually value, is pretty well defined. But how you then improve that well-being will depend the cultures and values and history of a, of a place, and we need to respect that. On that platform, we build infrastructures that make it happen, so economic, social, and environmental infrastructures. We build the right institutions. It could be uh, schools, hospitals, but also the rule of law and various other things, those are fundamental institutions that we build which will also reflect the uh, society in which you're living. That's why you cannot take the school system in Finland and bring it to New Zealand and implant it here, or the employment system in Germany and bring it here. It's completely culture and history dependent. And then on top of that, you start talking about wider things economic, environmental, and social policy interactions. So one that would resonate with you is that there is a big lack of debate in New Zealand how you can increase your material well-being without actually damaging the environment. What kinds of policies can you pursue so they travel together? So for example, concurrently you can subsidize and incentivize cleaner technology use which will enhance material well-being and in the schooling and other system encourage and invest in skilling and scientists and so on, and also open your doors to skilled people, uh, just like yourselves, to come in and prosper in the country. So that would be the way you have a public policy surrounding it. But sitting on top of that needs to be a very, very clear vision of where New Zealand wants to be, and that's a leadership issue. Uh, in terms of small countries, New Zealand is one of the, probably the few who resist uh, having a role for government in defining a vision for New Zealand. That's against our sort of core psyche. But the framework suggests that in fact you must do that in order to have a coordinated uh, and purposeful existence in a country. So that's the theory. Uh, You'll be surprised to find out, actually, although the living standards framework, as I've defined it, doesn't, um, is not a language that the central government and others use, the if you look at the total policy package we are pursuing and promoting, actually, all the pieces are there. 
There is a huge focus now on uh, eradicating poverty in a way that actually not only gives people money and housing and health and so on, but also in investing and in skilling them so they can participate productively in society. So that's the platform. There is a lot of focus on the other uh, aspects I talked about, such as um, the institutions, uh, such as promoting innovation and uh, investing and starting to worry about climate change and that kind of stuff. The beauty of having a framework of this sort is that you don't react to events after they happen. For example, we are focusing on poverty now after poverty has become a problem. We are, the risk is we will focus on the environment one day after environment becomes a problem. So when you actually um, uh, have a coordinated and, and integrated policy platform of the sort, what it does is to en encourage you to anticipate that unless you take uh, care of these issues, then it will be a problem in the future. So even if you're taking a just pure monetary um, lens on it, still you will pay for it. So just be aware of that. What are the challenges we are facing right now? The challenge is this broader framework is being seen as being anti-material prosperity. So one of the things you good people can do in your discussions and interactions with decision makers and all that is to actually convey the message that it is not that at all, that until and unless we take into account these various factors, environmental, social and economic issues in an integrated way, the whole thing collapses, as I said earlier, anyway. So we should be thinking about these in an integrated way. That's the current major challenge. And one of the reasons I engage with groups like yourself is to invite you to be part of that conversation. The other reason I engage with groups like yourself is to ask a very clean question. I have answered my own question as to what could be the role of a government public policy, but I would love to hear from people like yourselves when you look from where you are right now into the bureaucracy and machinery of government, local or, or national, what would you consider to be the um, domain of public policy and how can public policy help in promoting and supporting the kind of work you're doing? Especially since New Zealand always hides behind the uh, story that our productivity and material well-being is not as high as it should be because we are small and distant. My perspective on this is completely the opposite. If we can create an environment where all the creative people come and generate ideas and we invest and support in it, then this could be an incubator. We could scale it up by going to the rest of the world. So that would be the, you know, the, the fundamental point. So I'll leave it there and I'll uh, see whether you have any questions. Insults are welcome as well, by the way. <laughs> no problems. Thank you. Thank you.